of the United States of America. Amen. Amen. Uh, and I'm a patriot's patriot, but don't let your patriotism outshine being God's patriot. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you. We are His. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank, Thank you, you, worship team. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise your love, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The danger of playing it safe. The danger of playing it safe. Thank you, Lord. And I've got um, one scripture I want to read from before we move into really the text from which I'll be preaching and speaking from. But this is kind of the setup for it. The Apostle Paul had... had in his travels and his missionary journeys had come to Athens, Greece, and he was standing in a place called the Agapus, where all of these monuments, all of these statues, all of these shrines had been built to every god or goddess that had ever been presented to them. Anyone that came through that that had mention of and said, Oh, you don't know about you don't know about the goddess Diana? No. Well, we build a, better build a shrine to her. I mean, they had, they had shrines, statues, uh, memorials, if you will, built to every god or goddess that had never been introduced to them. Mm -hmm. Which in reality, since it wasn't the God of Israel, since it wasn't the only true and living God, meant they built shrines to demons. Amen. They built shrines to devils. And Paul is not even getting on to them. He even says, he says, God's overlooked this because of your ignorance. Mm -hmm. But he stands in the midst of all of that, of that demonic uh, uh, memorial garden, if you will, with all of these shrines. And he began to declare who this unknown God is. Because mm -hmm. they had one shrine. But they didn't want to make any God that they had overlooked mad. Which is kind of funny to me because... You know, why would God be honored by a, a, an inscription that said to the unknown God? Mm. Except that Paul used that as an occasion to declare to them who the real God is and who the true God is. Mm. And so uh, he, he does that. And out of that message, when he begins to preach that message, he says this in Acts 17, 28. He says, for in him, talking about Christ, talking about Jesus, in him we live and move and have our being. In him we live. Okay, let's define the word or uh, who we're talking about. In him. We're talking about Christ. If you read the whole message he preached, though, so he tells them who this unknown God is. And then he began to tell them what their, their approach to him is. Their approach to this God that they don't know, not their approach, Paul's approach, and the believers, the followers of Jesus. He says that in him, in Christ, we have, we are alive. We live in him. We owe all of our life and all of our breath to him. That's what he says. In him we live. Then he says, not only are we just alive in Christ, but in him we move. See, some people, and we're going to get to that when we move from this text to another. Some people say, well, I've been born again, I'm alive in God, but they don't move. That's right. Come on. <laughs> so he links these two things together. If you're going to be alive in Christ, then you also need to move Amen. in Christ. Amen. Let me ask you a question, uh, not personally, just generally speaking. Well, what moves you? Come on. What are you moved by? Because I want to suggest to you this morning that whatever moves you, has you. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Whatever moves you has you. Now I would be a liar if I got up this morning and said the only thing that should ever move you is God. Amen. That that's true. But in actuality, you're moved by other things. Come on. Right? Right. Uh, we we have uh, our sister, our sister Von Dell. Uh, just this past Monday, lost her son-in-law, 53, 57, very young. Uh, 
So our own Diana West, and Diana and, and uh, uh, Jerry that used to come here, it was Diana's her daughter. This was, this was her, one of her other daughters and her husband uh, passed away. And, and, and of course, you've heard my wife's testimony, three, three relatives. We've had so many deaths, and we ought to be moved by that. That ought to move us. Yes. But, but there's something that ought to move us greater than that. I get, listen, I still get moved. I can still hear sometimes a love song that was kind of in that era that when I was dating Cynthia. And I can get moved, you know what I mean? I mean, it just, it just like stirs the pot of my affection for her. I'm thinking, oh, that was one of, one of our, we didn't have just one song, we had several songs. You, I mean, a song can move you, can it not? Yes. Uh, I, I watched some college football yesterday. And uh, I, I really, I like the pros, I prefer the college football. I, I just like the, the rawness <laughs> of, of college football. I mean, those guys are out there banging heads and they get paid. Uh, but man, you watch those, you watch those fans in the stands. <laughs> and uh, they are moved by their team. Mm -hmm. And I mean, their faces are painted up. And, and uh, you know, I was watching my, my, my long, don't, don't move me, just take this moment to not boo me. <laughs> I was watching my longhorns yesterday take the lead. And you know, those horn frogs that had this little stupid little thing they do with a frog, I'm thinking, oh, a frog's really dangerous. They have this little thing like this. <laughs> thinking, what the heck would a frog do to even give you a wart? <laughs> but boy, when the, when, when the camel would get on them, more than give the frog, I, the frog move or something like this, they would do the horns down. They were so moved by their hatred of the horns that they want to get on camera with the horns down. Now listen, I, I say that jokingly, but listen, whatever moves you has you. That's right. I mean, they didn't want to get on camera with a, with a placard that said John 316. They wanted to get on the camera, not with a placard that said I love TCU. They wanted to get on camera by doing horns down. I, I, it's amazing to me that that... Before COVID ever existed in pro football, and I'm not a Buffalo Bills fan, but back in the 90s, you know, the Dallas Cowboys kicked their tails twice in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even a game. Some of the worst Super Bowls you ever going to watch. The Dallas just killed them. And you were thinking, how did this team get the Super Bowl? But they, that Buffalo has been, to, I think, three or four Super Bowls, not one one yet. Okay, this may be their year this year. I don't know. I'm not criticizing Buffalo. But listen, they were good. They had a really good quarterback. They had a good running back. They had a good receiver. They had a good team. Dallas was just better. And, and, uh, but, but when you would watch the Buffalo Bills, it could be snowing a blizzard and 20 degrees. You'd see these men in the stands with the shirts off and their hairy chest and say, you know, Buffalo Bills, they line up with it spelled on their chest and it's 25 degrees outside. And men won't come to church and sit 30 minutes. Man, preach it. Because they're removed by football. Yes. Come on. <laughs> so whatever moves you has you. Yeah, right. Come on. Preach it. Some of, some of us in the here sound of my voice, you're, you're moved by God, but you're more moved by other things. Because some of those things that move you would keep you out of church in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Come on. Some of those things that move you would keep you at, at its altar longer than you'd ever stay at the altar of the Lord. Come on. Come on. Am I speaking to anyone today but myself? Man, amen. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> But they said, in him we live. That was we're alive in Christ. You're never more alive. So you can be breathing but not alive. Yes. Just because you're breathing doesn't mean you're alive. You're not really alive until you're living in Christ. Amen. Amen. When you're born again, then you're really alive. Right. Yes. Amen. It's so like the reason I've been having this these last two weeks pray for pray for all the churches around because it breaks my heart. Listen, it's it's where the brethren dwell together in unity that Christ commands a blessing. Psalm 133. There the blessing will be commanded. Listen, we need right now, we don't need churches fighting over their doctrines right now. Our nation is in horrible shape. And we need all of the body of Christ, whether you're Baptist, Church of Christ, Methodist, Presbyterian, uh, Catholic, but if you're born again by the Spirit of God, we need to all be checking in for duty every day. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And I get, I get, I get tired of how, uh, how difficult it is to unite us and how easy it is to divide us. Come on. Yeah. Well, you've got an instrument in your worship. <laughs> Back away from me. We're not going to have any fellowship. 
Well, I heard your preacher quoting the NIV and not the King James. Don't have any of that church. They're not King James. I mean, are you kidding me? We got all kinds of things that we're so easily divided, and it's it's like pulling teeth to get us united. Listen, Christ died and shed his blood that we might be one blood. Amen. Yes. One blood. And if you read that whole message that Paul was was preaching there in Acts chapter 17 to that group of uh, of devil worshipers who said that Christ died that we might have one blood. Amen. And so the things that divide us. Well, one of the things that divided the, the divided people in, in Paul's day was the fact that they were male or female. And he said, well, in Christ there's neither male nor female. That was one thing that divided them. Another thing that divided them was, was whether you were, you were either, if you were Jewish, you were either Jewish and everything else was called a Gentile. Everything else was a dog. Everything else was, was less than. If you were Jewish, then you were the people of God in their eyes. And, and so uh, Jesus teaches us that in, in, in him, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. So he breaks down ethnic barriers. He breaks down gender barriers to create one blood. Amen? And so uh, what moves us? Do we have our, do, are we alive in Christ? Do we have, he says, and have our being? Our very, our very being. I mean, that's that's not just that's not just Sunday worship and Sunday Christianity. Being is 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 every day. I'm being in Christ. Amen. Amen. Is there an interesting that Jesus preached that famous message on the Sermon on the Mount, and we have what we call he didn't call it that, but the but the, but the word that we give it we call it the be attitudes. Right? They weren't the do attitudes. They were the Beatitudes. We have our being in Christ. And if I have my being in Christ, the doing will come. If we're moved by God, if we are moved by His majesty, if we are moved by His Spirit, He will always move us in a way that will give Him glory. He will always move us towards His purpose in our life. No one can find His purpose Anyone who lives outside of this maker. Because listen, we were, God created us. Don't you think that the, that, the, that the one who made us knows better what he created us for than we do? Yep. Amen. All right? Uh, so so, so to, to, to live and move and breathe and have our being in him is to move with purpose and move with destiny and what God created us as created beings to do. And so when you don't find your purpose, when you don't know what you were created to do, you really just wander aimlessly through this life. And you don't, you don't even know, well, why did God call me? Why am I a Christian? Why is Christ my Savior? What, what, what is, is, is there anything he desires of me? Oh, he does. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. He does. He desires for you and I to walk in our intended purpose for which he created us. Amen. He created works for us to do. Mm-hmm. And, he, and, and he desires that we walk in, in them. Matter of fact, Jesus said, you know, if you achieve the, if you obtain or achieve or, 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 or get the whole entire world without living out your design that God has made you for, he said, you can gain the whole world and lose yourself. That's right. Mm-hmm. See, we're chasing after our own purposes. What, what, what we think that we are supposed to be doing, and we miss what God's plan is. He said, you can, you can make great strides in, in, among humanity. You can make great strides in this culture. You can make great strides as an American. You, you can do all that. But if you do that and you never discover what your purpose in Christ is, that's all going to be burned up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's all going to be burned up. Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, the reason I said that you cannot find your purpose outside of outside of God. See, I wouldn't expect an unbeliever to know his purpose, his or her purpose. I wouldn't expect him to know that. No. But you know, we know the purpose of many things. I mentioned the military. We know we know what the purpose of the military is. And when and when someone signs up with that, they 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 have a mission or they have a purpose, and and, and then they have people in chains of command that make sure that gets carried out. And, 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 and everyone's flowing with the same purpose, the same goal, the same agenda. Not always, but that's the way it's designed to be. And that's the same with God. He has a, he has a, a master purpose, yes. an overarching, clear purpose. 
What is that? Well, it says that he's long-suffering, willing that none should perish. So what is God's overarching purpose, you know, when we, when we consider it corporately, is to get the lost saved. Amen. Yes. Yes. To get those that are dwelling in darkness to dwell in the light. That's what the overarching purpose is. Now, within that, we each have a part in that. And that's what, that's what we need to discover. So he says that... You know, I wrote this down. No man can find his purpose who lives outside of his maker or outside of his creator. John chapter 1 verse 4 and 5 says, In him, that's from our Christ, was a life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. So there are men that don't understand their, their, their creator shining his purpose into their life and because they're in darkness they don't understand it. And, and so Paul was preaching to those people who were living in ignorance. But listen, once he left that day, they had no excuse of ignorance any longer. Correct. So today, if you walk out here, you're going to hear the gospel preached again. No Amen. excuse Amen. Amen. So if, yeah. you, if you walk outside the purpose of God, then that's on you now. Amen. So now let's go and find out what that's like. Matthew chapter 25, and I'm going to I'm going to track through this pretty fast. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 14. Jesus is going to tell three parables here right in a row. In, in the 25th chapter of Matthew. Um, and the, the first one he tells the parable of the ten virgins. Virgins were, these virgins, it, it, it's, the, it's a parable of a wedding. And these virgins, these ten young ladies, these, they, were, they were part of the wedding team. All right, they were part of the wedding party. Now, forget the kind of wedding that you think of today where there's a time you're going to have it, you know, and you tell all of your the wedding party, be there at 10 a.m., the wedding's at 11 a.m., and everybody be there early. With, in these ancient weddings, you didn't know what the time was going to be. Mm -hmm. The bridegroom showed up because the bride chamber was ready, and nobody knew. You kind of could know. You could kind of see the progress of the bride chamber as it was being built and put together by the one who's going to have the bride. As that's being prepared, you kind of get some idea. So you knew it was getting close. Looks like that. He may, is he done with that bride chamber? I'm not sure. So they, you better be ready. And so the, the, as the parable, he tells there, these, these, these uh, ten young ladies, these ten virgins would come out at, at night with their, when it was dark. They'd have their lamps trimmed. In case he came, the bridegroom could come at any time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't unusual that it would come at nighttime. How I many of you know we have nighttime weddings too? And so it, it said they may come at midnight. So these, these ten who had signed up, they had said yes to the invitation of being part of the wedding party. They got five of them showed up on duty that night with no extra oil in their lamps. And they fell asleep because they didn't expect it to happen that night. And when they heard the voice crying from a distance, someone was, they would send a runner ahead. And the runner would say, the bridegroom's coming, the bridegroom's coming. They shook out of their slumber and they got up and they asked the five wise virgins, can we have some of your oil? They said, no, we didn't bring oil for you. I mean, we'll run out. Go in and buy you some. But they told them, what being mean? They were saying, okay, so what do you want to do? Do you want us to run out? <laughs> How do we translate that or interpret that? Or that? You can't live off somebody else's faith. That's right, amen. You can't live off of someone else's devotion. You can't live off of their relationship with Jesus. You've got to have your own. Yes. Right. And so while they went into town to get some oil and buy it, the, the bridegroom was closer than they thought, and they went in, and he shut the door, and he locked it, and they came back trying to get in. Here's what he said. He said, I don't know you. Because mm -hmm. if I had known you, you'd been ready. Mm -hmm. So we don't know the day or the hour, right? When Christ comes, we find faith. Okay, so that's the, that's the first parable. Then we get to this parable. The parable after this parable we're about to read is the parable of when, he, when the, Jesus is going to judge the nations. He's going to put the goats on, on his left and the, and the sheep on his right. And they're going to receive the, 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 the rewards of their labor or their lack thereof. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, let's, let's read this. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Now I've studied this out. This was no little amount of money. If you have the old King James, it will say talents. Five talents, two talents, one talent. This was no small amount of money. This was a lot of money. This was millions of dollars. This wasn't, this wasn't like someone just, just giving you, go, hey man, would you, I got $50 here. Would you 
watch that for me while I run into town or guard my little treasury here that's got a few hundred dollars in it, make sure nobody gets it, guard my Kool-Aid stand. No, this was this was this was wealth. And and he entrusted these three servants with it. And one got millions and millions, the other one got some millions, the other one got a million. Let's just break it down that way. One of them got multi-millions, the other one got multi-millions, but not as much as the first, and the, and the third one got a million. Still a lot of wealth. And it says that he, so it said that he did this, he was going on a journey, and he did that according to their ability. You do realize that we don't all have the same abilities. Correct. Right? I mean, we, we, we love to scream equality, and I believe, I believe in equality in the sense that our, our civil rights are guarded, but we are not all equal. Come on. That's right. Now, until, until we, just listen, what am I saying by this? Okay. Uh, wouldn't you think that someone that was raised in a, in a, in a godly Christian home, I mean, and I'm not talking about a religious home, I'm talking about relationally with Jesus, I mean, when they had family prayer time, family worship time, and there, and then, I mean, that, it was all lived out before them. And then you got this 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 kid that was born to some atheists, right? Now, as far as relation, as far as relating to the body of Christ and relating to hearing the voice of God, this one's got a head start, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He does have. I mean, we, we have to be we're going to have to be honest about that. That's one of the frustrating things for for youth pastors is this. They would get the youth on Wednesday nights, and they, and they would give them in 30 minutes, you know, a, a, a grandiose good word of God and good worship, and then send them back to a hellhole. Now, let me ask you this. Ones that were sent back to homes where that word would be, that was preached, would be reinforced, have got an advantage. Yes. Whether we want to admit it or not, they've got an advantage over the one that goes back home, and, and, they, and they maybe take the moment and say, they got so excited that night, they said, Dad or Mom, you know, I learned tonight that Jesus did that. Don't run that bullcorn by me. That's a bunch of mythology. That's a bunch of, that, that's just not true. I'll let you go to that church. Don't come home telling me that stuff. Who's got the advantage? The one where it's going to be reinforced, amen? So, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're equal in God's eyes in the sense that we're all created in the image of God. But some get a head start over others. Yes. That's life. That's, that, that, the part of that's generational curses. I don't want to get all into that. There's a whole lot of reasons for that. But, but, uh, but it's not where you start. It's where you finish. Yes. Some may start ahead of you, but that doesn't mean you can't catch them and surpass them. Come on. And so... He did this according to their ability. There was something in the character and the nature of that third servant that the, that the owner of all of this will said, I don't really know what he'll do with it. And I know what this first one's going to do with it. I know what this second one's going to do with it. This third one. But, but nonetheless, he still got an enormous amount of money. Now, if you look at the Luke 19 passage, Luke says that when he went off on, on the journey, that he says, told them, do business till I come. Do business till I come. That's in Luke chapter 19. And uh, it's a parallel parable, parable to this. And so watch what he says. He says, verse 16, the man who received five bags of gold, now don't overlook that, went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. He didn't hesitate. He didn't procrastinate. He wasn't lazy. He wasn't apathetic. He didn't say, I wonder how much time I've got. Usually when, usually when my master goes away, he's gone quite a while. I'll get started next week. He says he went at once. Yes. You know what you need to do when you get revelation from God? You need to act on it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, I don't mean some things to act on. You know, it might mean, mean it, the action may mean wait. That's not what I'm saying. But you don't do it. When, when God gives us something to do, when God gives us a revelation, we, we don't, God may speak to some of you this morning, and I'll tell you this. If you say, God, I think I just heard you, but I'm really, I'm hungry. I'm going to go get some lunch. I'm going to watch the Cowboys. And then we'll kind of talk about that later. What happens later will never come. Because come <laughs> when you walk out of there, the enemy will snatch up what you've already heard. That's right. Write down what God speaks to you. Write down what you hear that just that resonates in your spirit. That It's like I'm speaking, but those words come at you in 3D. Yes. And they come floating right at you. Write those things down. This the this. The master gave them this money and he said, do business till I come. And that first one, that's why he got the most. Because that master, he said, Man, this guy will do something. Maybe the reason we don't, can't hear God or what he's, we say, oh, what's God got for me? Because we always put it off. Yep. Our, our track record already showed we won't do anything with it anyways. 
See, God's looking for any faithful servant through whom to perform His Word that will be obedient and faithful to it. Whether you're man or woman, rich or poor, red, yellow, black or white, He's just looking for a faithful servant who will hear Him and then respond. Right. And we are so, we've got used to just say an amen as a response. Doesn't mean we amen something as a response, but it doesn't mean we're going to do it. That's right. right. But I'm going to amen it because someone needs to do that. <laughs> Right? Yep. So notice he says he, he went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one who had two bags of gold, he gained two more. So he did he did the exact same thing. He went at once, the one who had two. He went at once and put it to work. And uh, he got he made two more. But the third man, mm -hmm. but the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground. And hid his master's money. Mm -hmm. After a long time. You know, Jesus has been ascended to the Father a long time. 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. But in eternity, that's nothing. The Bible says that a 1,000 years is like a day to God. Mm -hmm. So if, from heaven's perspective of time, and really there is no time in heaven, by the way. Correct. But from heaven's perspective that we can understand it from earthly terms, Jesus has been gone two days. I mean, think about that. So, you know, the church through the ages has gotten lulled to sleep. Because they, 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 they've grown tired of preachers standing up and going, it could be any day now. It could be any day now. It could be, it, Christ could come today. Well, that's been true. And it's still true. He could. Mm -hmm. We don't know the, the hour or the time, but he's coming. And so, this guy, he went off, he dug and put a hole in the ground, and he, he hid his master's money. And after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Yeah, I was thinking, I'll never preach this. And I'm not saying this is true. There's just something I thought about. I got to thinking yesterday, what if this guy put that money in the ground thinking, hey, what if something happens to my master and he never comes back? I got me a little stockpile of money. This will be mine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like he was treating it. It was like, like, like it was his instead of his master's because his master said, what? Well, do business till I come. Yep. They certainly knew what that meant. That meant put this money to work for us or for me. But he went and dug the hole and put it in the ground. And, and he was almost acting like what was given to him that wasn't his was his. Hmm. Sometimes that ministry we get, we act like it's ours. Come on. Mm -hmm. That's right. God gives us that ministry. Yep. Glory. God gives it to us. So then the, the master comes back. This guy's got this gold buried. And uh, and I, I, I just have to know this guy's knees were knocking. He's thinking, oh, man, back sooner than I thought. I was hoping he wouldn't even come back. But here he is. But, well, at least I got his gold. Yeah. Woo. All right. Well, at, least I, at least I give him back what he gave me. So it says that he settled, went to settle up accounts with them. And so he calls the guy, I'm going to instead of reading all this, I'm going to just kind of walk you through it. So the guy, he calls the guy with, with the first one. All right, show me what you did with your five. He said, well, I'll make you five more. So he doubled. He doubled this, what, what was the risk. He calls the second one, and the second guy doubled it also. Amen? So, so then he calls the third guy, and the third guy goes, well, you know, I knew you were a hard guy. I knew you were a money, penny, pension guy. And always... Wanting to get something that you didn't even work for? What did he say to him? He said, I, I, just you, I, I knew you were a hard man, so I hit it in the ground. And here it is. Okay? And so, here's what Jesus did. He said, all right, all right. He called him. Let's see what, let's see what other things he called him. He said, first of the other two men, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Uh, with this guy, with the one bag, I'm going to get down to verse 26. When he, when he told him, he said, Here, see, here's what's yours. I mean, y'all be happy with me. People, there, listen, hear me now. There are going to be people that are going to meet Jesus in the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, thinking Christ is real happy with him. He's going to go, mm, you didn't do too much with what I gave you. Yep. Mm -hmm. You didn't do too much. Uh, so here's what the master said about it. He said, the master replied, he called him up. He said, you wicked, I'm in verse 26, you wicked 
Wicked. That's what he called him. Wicked. Yep. Lazy. He called him lazy. You wicked and lazy servant. Since out of your own mouth you've declared that you thought you knew what kind of person I was, yet if you thought I was that kind of person, your actions didn't even meet that. In other words, if you thought I really wanted to return in my, in my business that I left with you, your actions didn't even reflect that. In other words, he was just making excuses of what he was doing. He was giving excuses as to why he didn't do what he was told to do with what he was given. Amen. Can I tell you this? We will have no excuses in heaven. Right. At the Bema seat of Christ, there will be no excuses. I mean, we can make all kinds of, I mean, our, our judges and our, whether, you know, state, county, you know, local, state, or federal, they've heard it all. I mean, there's teachers, all you people, all your teachers have heard it all about what happened to the homework, right? And there are, listen, there'll be no excuses given. You, know, you want to be able to open your mouth with an excuse. So, then he goes, he, he says, he, he makes an amazing statement here. See, now, today, in the culture that we live in today, which says everyone ought to get a trophy. I'm going to step check. on some carriage toes. <laughs> everyone ought to get a trophy. Everyone ought to get the same thing. That's called socialism. Everyone ought to get the same thing. So let me get this straight. So my job demands this, and it demands this much talent, this much uh, of a brain. And you're saying that that I'm I'm only worth as much, or my my, my value of my job is only worth as much as, as this guy over here that, that that doesn't really do anything. Come on. Uh, so I, I, I want to understand something. I want to understand something about the kingdom of God. There's risk and reward. Let me say that again. In the kingdom of God, there's risk and there's reward. See, and, and listen, here, you can take this to bank on those of you with, with are raising kids. Here's a proper biblical way to raise your kids. You reward them when they do right. You do not reward them when they do wrong. That's right. You reward them when they do right. That's the incentive to do right again the next time. And so when you have multiple children and two of your children get rewarded because they did all of their chores, or they made the A's on the report, or whatever it is. You're, the structure of your home ought to be risk and reward. If you don't do what the instructions say to do, you're taking a risk. Yep. And I'm going to find out. And you're going to lose your reward. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing that will happen. Listen, why would, why would, if everyone gets a participation trophy, why does one guy need to try harder than the other? Why does one girl softball player need to try harder than the other? I mean, are, are you kidding me? If, 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 if there's no, why does the guy, my brother Merrill back here is a, is a wonderful example. I mean, he, he risked, he quit a really good job, really good job, that he'd been there years and years, and said, I'm going to start a restaurant. Can I tell you something? He never owned a restaurant. Listen, I didn't know it. You never owned a restaurant, did you? Never owned a restaurant. Now, the guy can cook, and, uh, but he never owned a restaurant. And him and Daryl Hoyt went into restaurant business together. Was there a risk? Oh, you better believe there was a risk. It was a huge risk. I mean, his kids are all still at home. He's got a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> the youngest was here today. He goes, I'm done. He's got a lot of kids. I mean, there was a lot of risk involved in that. I'm, I'm thinking of Jack Wilson, same thing. He, he, he quit driving a truck and said, I'm going to do something else. I'll be in my family. Took a big risk. Listen, the, when you, if you want reward, <laughs> the greater the risk, the greater the reward. That's right. I mean, the guy that had five bags of gold took a bigger risk than the guy who hid one bag. So listen, when we're raising our kids, when we're raising our, from a young age up, always have a, a, a punishment that fits the crime. All right? You don't punish a two-year-old the same way you punish a teenager, right? But the punishment is we don't reward them for bad behavior. That's right. This is why we have riots in the streets, because we reward people for bad behavior. But we ought to listen. We reward for good behavior. 
It's not about salvation. I'm not talking about salvation by works. Please don't hear me saying that. We are saved by grace through faith. Amen. And that's not in and of yourself. God gives you the faith to believe Amen. Amen. But you have to risk the faith that he gave you to put your trust in him. Yes. I'm not talking about salvation here. But but there is going to be a time when, when, when rewards are divvied out. Yes. The things that we did for God. And the things that we didn't do for God that we did for ourselves. The Bible says that's what had stumbled. You won't lose your salvation. Don't get that. There will be things we did here that are going to burn up. They're not going to survive the being a seed of Christ. They're just going to, they were just worldly things. Not like we're going to have a bonfire just going to go, well, no, you just said, no, no, no. You, you really did that for the applause of man. So you got your you got your reward on earth. You chose to have the reward there. Mm. What I'm going to reward for is the things that you did for me that you didn't expect anything in return. Come on. Amen. Yes. Yes. The risks that you took. Yes. Every time you every time you go to minister somebody, you take a risk. That's right. I mean, Brother Terry Smith was just telling me about a, a, a man who recently died. That I was with him. He had a dream, and in this dream, he was to go witness to this, this man. This man, this man was unsaved, and, and he took a risk, and he went there because he, he told me he said, "Brother Tom, I don't think this, I don't know how it's going to be received. Man, this this guy could be pretty mean." And Terry took the risk, and he went witness the guy, and the guy sure told him, "Get the heck out of here." I don't want to hear what you got to say. Well, I don't know. I just pray. I pray to God that before he died, that he heard what Terry said and responded. I don't know that he did or didn't. God was a judge, not me. Uh, but he won't have any excuse if he did. Right, right. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, risk, risk, and reward. I'm going to go through this real fast. If you're riding, you have to ride fast. Uh, in this risk and reward system, which is a, which is which is kingdom, is a, is a kingdom system. Um, you didn't have a proper proper understanding of ownership. See, when, 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 when you work for somebody else, you need to understand that you don't own that, they do. Amen? Right. You know, if we, if, we, if we were just more workers that understand my boss gave me a job and he owns this business, and, 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 and we're going to treat it as if, yeah, because some people don't take care of their own stuff. And then when they go to work somewhere, they treat it like they with their own stuff. This isn't your stuff. Come on. Amen. It's not your stuff. Someone else owns it. Have a proper understanding of ownership. Well, if you're going to be born again, if you are born again, then know this. You no longer own yourself. If you choose the blood of Jesus to redeem you, Paul said, I'm no longer, it's no longer I that live, but Christ in me. Yep. Have proper understanding of ownership. God owns it all. Amen. It all belongs to him. Amen. It's all his. It's not mine. It's his. We get to steward it. Amen. So have a proper understanding of ownership. These, these, these guys had a, the first two had a proper understanding of ownership. Uh, to whom much is given, much is required. Amen. But did you, did you notice the guy that, that took the biggest risk when the one guy with the bag of gold, it was taken from him and given to the guy who already had ten. Now, I know a lot of people today in our in our culture of the United would say, Well that ain't even right. You should take from the rich and give to the poor. Come on. That's right. But what if the poor are poor? I'm not talking about people that can't help being poor. I'm not talking about that. Some people are poor because they're lazy. Come on. That's right. Some people are poor because they don't have a proper understanding of ownership. Come on. Some people are poor because of the decisions. They've made poor decisions all their life. That's right. That's right. And I'm not talking about people that are that are that are poor by no fault of that. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't hear me saying that. Don't go away and say, Boy, Tom just hates poor people. I love poor people. I'm 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 not poor in spirit, but I'm not rich. Yeah, I, I, I was there where did any of you have that time in your life when I worked my honey off, a hard job, and when I got my paycheck on Friday, it was already gone. Come on. I mean, literally, I had bills on our paper. It's gone. Come on. We're all week and you think, I kept thinking, is it going to be a week that I have a paycheck I can do something with? It never happened. Yeah. Unless I fudge somebody else and I put them off a month. That's right. It just, I work just to pay bills. Come on. That's right. So, uh, I mean, I don't poor as like. I, I have much empathy and much sympathy. And, and, and I understand Jesus said the poor we have with you always. But just know this that that's not a proper understanding that. that if you think that because, if any of us think we deserve something, 
without any effort on our part. Sometimes we say, I'm the, I'm the, uh, I'm the giver out. That's a word I just made up. I administrate the funds of the Ministry Alliance. And there are people that I administrate funds to, administrate funds to, that you never even get a thank you. Mm. There's some that are an expectancy. I mean, they just, they'll just come to the church door and uh, there's an expectancy. And so, listen, the Father's house works for poor people. Thank you. Amen. This is not this is our, we're not a rich church, but we're rich in Christ. Oh, amen. 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 Praise God. And because we've always remembered the poor, God has blessed us. Amen. 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 And we thank God for that. Have a proper understanding of ownership. Know that responsibility comes with what God has given you. There's responsibility in what you've been given. Uh, the knowledge of expectancy. The, the, these two guys were expecting the first two. They said he's going to come back. We don't know when. But when he comes, we better have done what he said to do. So they immediately began. They didn't wait. They didn't delay. They got after it. And so there's this knowledge of expectancy. We, you know, we, we, we've grown. We've been lulled to sleep in the church. And I, I really believe we've got to that place. Where we go, you know, I just don't know think Christ is going to come in my lifetime. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. And Christ will come when you least expect it. Have the knowledge of expectancy. Do we live with the expectancy mm -hmm. that Christ can come any time? Do we live with the expectancy that there will be a reckoning of what we have done with what Christ gave us when he delivered that expectancy? Uh, number four, trust the pattern. Now here, here where I get this from, uh, this particular uh, sub point is this. I don't think this, I don't think this owner just handed them money and then went away and said do business. I think he already taught them how to do business. They have watched him. It was the pattern of how you take wealth and make wealth. He was the he just he didn't just give he didn't just give five million to a guy that had never handled any money. He he was the pattern. He had taught them. So he said, "Now I'm gonna I'm gonna leave, and you do what I've taught you to do. Do business till I come." Jesus said, "The things you've seen that me do, right? Did he say this? I'm gonna go away. When I go away, I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. And listen, greater things than." Then you see me do, you shall do. Not greater in the sense that, that we'll do bigger miracles. We can do more of them. Because yes. we have the pattern. We look at Jesus. He's the pattern. These guys had a pattern, but one of them chose not to follow the pattern. Mm -hmm. He chose to do it his way. So trust the pattern. Two of them did, and one of them did not. I promise I'm nearly done. Uh, Real quick, here's the reasons I believe. I jotted down the reasons I believe he played it safe. Remember I said the dangers of playing it safe. But I hope you you heard them there that he lost everything. He played it safe. And what he thought, he, he thought he played it safe and didn't get anything out of it. Come on. Got nothing. And so uh, here's some reasons I think he played it safe. And I think we can find these in the text. But I'm not going to reread the text, okay? He was fearful. He thought, he thought I was scared of you. I, I was scared that that I might not do the right thing with this million dollars. I, 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 so he was fearful. Listen, listen, there, there is no reward for fear. The reward of fear is torment. That's right. But Paul told Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. So he did, part of what he did, he did out of fear. That's why he played it safe. Secondly, he played it safe because he was wicked. Yes. He was wicked. That's why, that's why the master didn't trust him with much. Mm. There, there are people in your lives that I'm, I'm going to use money now because this is, this is a parable. He's not talking about money. He's talking about the things that we do in ministry for the Lord. Okay? But usually, there, there are people you know right now, maybe some of your own children, own siblings, you'd go, hmm. They want to borrow five thousand dollars. No, I can't trust them with five thousand dollars. So you might do something like this. Tell me what you what bill you need to pay. I'll pay them. I'm not giving you five thousand dollars. Right? I mean, we know those, right? And so uh, this man, somebody another, he, he was described as wicked, uh, which means that the rain it God it rains on the just as well as the unjust. Even the wicked get a chance. All right. The the, the the owner uh, described him, his master described him as lazy. He said, you, you're, you're lazy and you're wicked. Some people are just lazy. Mm -hmm. They're just lazy. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want they, they, they to they draw a paycheck and do nothing. Right. They don't want anything for it. Just, just, just pay me. 
They don't want to do anything for it. They don't want to, don't want to work for it. We found this out, didn't we, when we passed all that money out? That's right. And now all our business is going, well, somebody please come to work. Well, I don't need to come to work. I'm getting $600 a week as it is. We're doing nothing. Right. Why would I work for you and I'm getting $600 a week? We're doing nothing. So what did we breathe in our United States? Listen, don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you the truth. Did people need COVID money? Many of them did. Not all of them did. And what it's called now, now we have a workage problem in America. Right. We have help wanted signs everywhere. If you can't find a job right now, you ain't looking. That's right. Help right. <laughs> wanted signs everywhere. Now, and finally, I believe I believe he was manipulative and controlled. You see, what manipulation and control will do if you're one of those people, you'll always play it safe because you don't want anything to lose the grip of your hand. Mm -hmm. See, if he put that million dollars to work, he didn't have to let go of it. Yep. And if you're controlling, you don't want to let go of things. That's right. But he was controlled. I've got, I'm going to take control of this million dollars. But that million dollars profited nothing in his hands. As long as you and I, you or I think that we're going to stay in control, our control, utter control of things that God has given us, they'll not profit because of us. But God will watch over his word. And he will watch over his God-ordained ministries and will invest, will invest into the world what God has given us, the Spirit of God in us, the resurrection power that flows in us, we'll invest that in the world. We will get a return. Yes. Amen. That's right. Not grow weary and well doing. That's right. That's right. That's right. For in due time, you shall reap, reap if you don't lose heart. Would you stand? It's good. <laughs> awesome. Now, don't play it safe, maybe, maybe something totally different to you. I find that people play it safe. Uh, I think I mentioned this last week. Some people play it safe with the world. They say, well, you know, I don't want people to think I'm some, some far-fetched uh, Jesus freak. And so they kind of they kind of keep one foot here in the world and one foot in the kingdom. And they play it safe. When they're over here with the world, they can, they can look just look like the world, act just like the world. Even use the same language as the world. Even do the same things the world does. Yep. They play it safe. Yeah. Because they just they want to be in control. What would they think of me if I stepped all the way into the kingdom and was only Christ minded? They, I mean, I know I know I know how they talk about other crazy Christians. I know what they say about people who sell it all out to Jesus. I know the kind of things they say. So play it safe for you maybe that you just need to need to quit playing it safe with the world and just go ahead and, and say. Jesus, I'm your Lord, and I don't care who knows. Amen. 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 I don't care who knows. Plan it safe could be that you do all of your ministry behind a computer screen. But in real life, you wouldn't be caught doing it. Come on. <clears throat> now, you didn't have me say it. It's wrong to, to minister through through the technology we have, we need to. But sometimes it's easier to do that from the comfort of my own house than it is to step out of my house and go meet someone face to face. Yes. Because well. when you do it from a computer screen, you can cut off the comments if people are, are, are making bad comments, but you just cut those off. You can hide them, you can block them. Yep. But boy, when you go to the house, mm -hmm. say, I came here to tell you about Jesus. Yeah. Get a few doors slammed in your face. Yep. Get to where you can walk away going, God, I rejoice that I suffered for your name's sake. Amen. 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 So, plain and safe can mean a lot of things. Whatever that means for you, let the Lord speak to you. Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus you would speak as only you can speak by your word. God, I pray that someone in this room, and I pray actually all, and all of those listening online, would have an aha moment when they said, I've been playing it safe. I've been trying to control. I've been fearful. I've been afraid. I, I, I didn't want to risk it. But God, today, I'm going to risk it all. Everything I have and everything I am is yours. Now, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up your face unto his face. 
give you his peace. Yes. And may you quit playing it safe. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.